So welcome everyone. My name is Elizabeth Colucci. I will be speaking very little today, but I am um, formally opening this event on behalf of the HACWA 2 implementing team. HACWA is the initiative entitled Harmonization, uh, Accreditation, and uh, quality, assurance, quality Assurance in African Higher Education. It is a flagship initiative of the European Union in partnership with the African Union Commission. Uh, HACWA is supporting uh, a series of dialogue events called CESA Higher Education in Focus. CESA stands for the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, and we will shortly hear more about that from one of our colleagues from the African Union Commission. Um, before I proceed in welcoming um, some of our, our, our first speakers this morning, I just wanted to make some technical announcements. You will note that we have interpretation. So if you look at the bottom of your uh, screen on the Zoom menu, you will see an icon called interpretation. It looks like a little globe. And there you can select one of three languages, English, French, or Portuguese. Uh, we have selected these languages to be as inclusive as possible in these continental African events. As you know, we bring together many different linguistic communities in the African continent. We haven't included all of the languages, but we have included three uh, quite important languages. And so we do hope that we will have a lot of participants today joining us from different language groups. Um, Please note that you don't have to use the interpretation. If you, if you understand all of the languages, you can simply leave it as off if you prefer. Um, in addition to that, this event will be recorded today. The um, one nice element of today's activity is that there will be breakout group discussions and our host, uh, Charmaine Villet, will be explaining that come the time. Uh, when you registered, you had the opportunity to select a breakout group. Uh, if you hadn't decided at the time, you will be able to decide when we come to the point of the meeting where you can select the breakout group because uh, your screen will indicate which, uh, which meeting, which thematic subgroups are, are, are possible. Um, and finally, I would just like to say um, that this event is recorded. I think I, I mentioned that previously. The breakout groups will also be recorded. So all of this material will be available, available on the CESA in Focus website and also on the uh, HAKWATU website after the event. Um, I would like now to introduce uh, a few speakers who will be giving some short welcoming words. Uh, in first instance, Deirdre Lenin from the European Union Commission, who has been um, very much the, uh, the, uh, the champion of uh, Africa-EU partnership in higher education and is, and is the, the project coordinator uh, of the HACWA initiative. Uh, Deirdre, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And hello, Charmaine, it's lovely to see you. Uh, we collaborated together on Tuning Africa in the framework of uh, the Africa-EU partnership. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and I'd like to welcome also uh, the colleagues from the African Union Commission, the AAU, INEA, oh. if they're present, and um, the colleagues at Obreal and every, all the participants here today. Um, I think uh, the issues, the topic that's going to be discussed today is particularly relevant not only for Africa but also for Europe. Uh, we're going through profound reflections and um, on how education was affected by the pandemic um, and also how we really need to transform uh, education to build skills for the future and uh, the role of uh, teaching, the role of, of contents, um, the skills that the students are, are you know, um, are expected to, to acquire during, uh, during their study programs. And so all this is particularly relevant. Um, the uh, partnership that we have with the Africa, uh, African Union, uh, African member states, and uh, in particular in the field of higher education, is a very prominent part of our um, agenda for the coming um, six years. And significant funding will be made available through Erasmus notably to be able to support projects and initiatives that yourselves, your universities, would like to undertake to support some of the discussions, the debates and the initiatives that you might uh, think of undertaking uh, as a result of, the, of these debates. 
Um, the HACWA initiative is uh, supporting the African Union's continental agenda. And it's in this framework that this event has been taking place and I'm very pleased to be able to, to hear the discussions today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deirdre, and thank you for being with us today. Um, I would now like to, to give the floor to Emmanuel uh, Chigozi, who joins us from the African Union Commission. He is responsible for um, all the initiatives linked uh, to higher education under the Africa EU Strategic Partnership. Uh, Emmanuel, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me, please? Yes, we can. Uh, apologies, my, my video is not uh, coming on, but I'll just give the remarks uh, there was. Um, my name is Chigozie Emmanuel Okonkwo, and I'm with the Education Division of the African Union Commission. And on behalf of my principal, uh, the acting head of education division at the African Union Commission, uh, Mr. Hambani Masheleni, uh, it is a pleasure to welcome us to this uh, auspicious event uh, in the series of um, CISA Higher Education in Focus uh, event. Uh, colleagues, uh, COVID-19 has forced us to a new uh, paradigm that affects uh, how we work uh, and how we deliver on our mandate and promises to the African citizenry. Uh, even though COVID-19 is first of all a health crisis, we as stakeholders active in education development uh, can testify to the impact it had on um, teaching, learning uh, in Africa especially. The theme of today's discussion, preparing higher education students for a complex world and exploring the fluidity of teaching, learning, and curriculum post-COVID comes at a critical time when institutions of higher learning are reimagining their mode of teaching, uh, students are reimagining their mode of learning, and education policymakers and curriculum developers are reimagining the relevance of curriculum to meet the present day challenge. Uh, looking at the the theme of the discourse today, it is ideal that we are already exploring the, the fluidity of teaching, uh, learning, and curriculum. But it is also important to highlight current efforts geared towards ensuring continuous learning uh, and uh, teaching, even in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, whilst the COVID-19 is first and foremost a, a member state's uh, public health challenge, we at the AUC have an important and central role to, to support them to coordinate our AU-wide response and help ensuring that potential needs and gap are met. This is precisely why we have been, in the past year, uh, our education sector response, uh, which is uh, drawn from the DOTS framework, which is um, D-O-T-S-S, which speaks to digital connectivity of schools. This um, advocates for schools and other learning institu institutions to be connected to the internet and to become hub for providing internet access uh, to deprived community. The O, which stands for online learning, uh, seeks to provide distance learning content, deploying radio, TV, podcast, and online e-learning facilities to mitigate against the challenges uh, of today. Uh, the T stands for teachers as facilitators and motivators of learning. We identified that teachers should deploy relevant technologies such as webinars to continue to engage and motivate learners to learn. We also speak of S, which is safety online and offline. As more uh, children, pupils uh, use the internet for learning, they become increasingly, increasingly vulnerable to online uh, exploitations. Uh, we also speak of the second S, which is skills uh, focused learning, which I think is more relevant to the discussion here today. Uh, the curriculum that we, we, we issue out should embrace the 360 degrees approach to skills development, combining foundation, foundational digital 21st century and entrepreneurial job skills uh, to address the challenges of today. It is our belief that uh, with this framework, Continuity of learning is assured, and most importantly, education in Africa is transformed 
to better mitigate against similar challenge in the future. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we'll learn a lot from uh, our speakers here today on the subject matter. But before I yield the floor, let me thank our partners, uh, the EU, Obreu uh, Global, AAU, uh, INHEA, uh, for their, and all clusters, higher education cluster member for their continuous uh, support on this um, higher education in focus series. Uh, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emmanuel, and thank you for providing that that framework for the participants, which I think is quite important. Um, I would now like to pass the floor to the Association of African Universities, uh, which is not only an, an implementing partner of the HACWA2 initiative, but the AAU is also the co-coordinator of the CESA Higher Education Cluster. Um, I believe Prof. Healy, the Secretary General, is with us today. Yes, good afternoon to you all. This is Professor Etienne Hide, the Secretary General of the Association of African Universities. It is a pleasure to welcome you all to the current session of a series of webinars in the framework of CISA and the HAPA2 uh, project. That you rightly said it earlier, AAU is part of the consortium to implement HAPA2 project and the AAU is also the host of the Higher Education CISA cluster. Therefore, the presence of AAU in this forum is uh, relevant, and I wish us all fruitful debates uh, in the plenary sessions as well as the breakout session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etienne. Pleasure, and as uh, usual, we are very grateful for the fruitful relationship with the AAU, uh, which is indeed the one continental uh, African Association for Universities. Um, I would like to now uh, give the floor to our chair of today's deliberations, uh, Dr. Charmaine Villet. Uh, Charmaine is the Dean of Faculty of Education at the University of Namibia. Uh, she uh, is also the the coordinator of a subcluster of the CESA Higher Education Cluster uh, on curricula. Um, the CESA Higher Education Structure is a complex one. What you need to know is that it is divided uh, in terms of its implementation and its follow-up is divided into a series of clusters. One of those clusters is dedicated to higher education and we are working with a number of sub-coordinators of the higher education cluster to bring forward these dialogues with you. Um, Charmaine is coordinating the one on curriculum and has put forth uh, the program uh, today. I would also like to just say that the transversal thread through uh, these dialogue events that we are hosting is really the notion of better data for African higher education. We are using, using these dialogue events to feed into the process of setting up what will be called a policy data unit, which will be dedicated at collecting more coherent and, and relevant data uh, on the higher education sector to inform policy making. This will be a process to assess how this unit can be best established. Um, but we thought it was important to explore different thematic elements that are part of the CESA strategy and to look also at how data um, is collected or not collected, where the holes are, where it can be approved, improved, etc. So you will see in the breakout discussions, there will be an opportunity to tackle that topic as well. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Charmaine, who will uh, introduce to you the format of today's meeting and provide you more uh, thematic background uh, on today's discussions. Charmaine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to all the uh, speakers previously and, and for their kind words of support. Um, I saw Jonathan was here as well, Jonathan Ba. I'm not sure if he would like to say something before I introduce the speaker, just to, is, is it okay? Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe. Thank you very much, Shamir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm happy. My boss, Professor Hile, the Secretary General, has already spoken. 
just to say that uh, we are happy that uh, our CESA Higher Education Focus uh, online events are moving on very well. The attendance at today's meeting have been very encouraging, similar to what we had uh, uh, last mm -hmm. week. So we are, we are happy that we are continuing with this discussion and uh, under your guidance and uh, uh, leadership, we'll be able to go through the event for today. So we are happy to have you on board. And as Elizabeth has mentioned, we, 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 we want to see how the whole uh, discussion feast into our data policy next use and how we'll be able to lay the groundwork yeah. for the development of the policy yeah. data unit. Yeah. So thank you very much yeah. for the yeah. opportunity and uh, we hope that uh, the discussion will be very fruitful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, so as everybody has already indicated, this event is focused on preparing higher education students for a complex world, exploring the fluidity of teaching, learning, and curriculum post-COVID. Um, for that uh, uh, event, we have a, a colleague who is going to be doing a presentation on this topic um, for the next uh, uh, 45, 40 to 45 minutes, um, and I'm going to be introducing him in a minute. I just wanted to uh, just um, uh, emphasize the format of this event. We will have this uh, plenary session where we're going to be having this um, presentation, um, after which we will provide an opportunity for a few comments. You can also put your comments in the chat. Um, if you prefer it that way, but we will not spend a lot of time um, after the presentation because you to go and do some more discussion on these topics in thematic groups that um, will be done in the breakout groups. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see there's um, a button that uh, shows breakout rooms. Just to indicate to you, there will be four breakout sessions. Uh, the first one will continue in the plenary that uh, uh, breakout session that we have, or the plenary that we have now, that will be breakout session one. And then uh, two, three, and four, you will have to then select from these, uh, from, uh, by clicking on the button. So it will give you the opportunity to, um, to select a breakout session. Uh, you will also see in the chat, um, Eloy has put down there the different um, thematic discussions that will happen in the different breakout um, rooms. So uh, just ensure that you know which discussion is happening in which room, and then uh, just click on that, and then you will automatically be transported into that breakout session room. So having said that, um, let me just introduce our speaker for today. It's Professor Paul. Hanstead is the founding director of the Houston H. Hart Center for Teaching and Learning at Washington and Lee University in Virginia. He has worked with dozens of universities on four continents to support curricular and pedagogical reform and innovation, including a Fulbright here helping Hong Kong University to move from a three to a four year tertiary model. He's the recipient of multiple teaching awards and has authored several books, including General Education Essentials and Creating Wicked Students, as well as Hong Kong, which is a travel, a travel memoir documenting experience <laughs> small children. So um, Paul will do our presentation today. I hope you will really enjoy what Paul has to tell us. So Paul, it's over to you. Thank you, Professor Villette. And um, thank you to all of the various commissions for the invitation to speak uh, with this, this community today. Um, as, as Professor Villette mentioned, I, um, among other things, I am a, a, a travel writer. Uh, and, and it's worth noting that the very first uh, continent outside of North America that I visited was Africa. And I spent some time in both Tanzania and Malawi. So if there are any colleagues from, from uh, there, please um, 
know that that your presence here and my presence here and my this opportunity to speak is a, a really a, a very nice sort of uh, homecoming in some ways for me. Um, I'm very grateful to the commission for um, this invitation. I am joining you today from my, as you can see, from my very modest office uh, in Virginia. Um, I actually don't even know where the background is from, but it felt like um, uh, my, I've been like everybody else, I've been working from home for the recent months and having, uh, it, it felt like I wanted to uh, reconnect with uh, the academic community and a sense of uh, literature and books and ideas. So uh, you've, you've heard the title for my work. Where I'd like, or for my talk today, where I'd like to begin is simply by presenting to you these five terms on the right-hand side of your screen, poverty, migration, climate change, food insecurity, and education. My question for you, of course, would be what do all five of these have in common. Now, since we're a room full of academics, it would be very easy for us to come up with probably a, a dozen different answers, uh, maybe even more. Um, most people will recognize that, that the first four at least are definitely problems, issues that we try to resolve. What complicates, of course, that, that reading of these is that four, fifth one, education, because of course, for many of us, education feels more like a solution uh, than a problem. And I'll unpack these in just a moment. In my mind, what they all have in common is that they are related to a particular kind of problem called wicked problems. I first encountered this term when I was working in Hong Kong about a decade ago. I was working with an engineering professor named Edmund Ko, who was uh, Stanford University educated. And when I met him, he was at the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And he talked about the field of engineering, which had a particular kind of problems that students faced when they, when they stepped uh, out into the world after graduation. They were referred to as wicked problems. And what they were, problems where the dynamics were changing constantly, where the was in flux, where the situation was very fluid. In addition, wicked problems were resistant to previous solutions. Um, things that had worked before weren't going to work this time. Further, oftentimes with wicked problems, the data is incomplete. We don't know um, uh, exactly what is going on. In addition, sometimes there are competing viewpoints, both about how to solve the problem, but even sometimes about the existence of the problem. And you find this a lot um, in, in my home country, unfortunately, at the moment. Politically, we are so divided that we can't even agree about what is a problem. The problems must be solved. It is not optional. We can't simply step, step away from the question of um, water scarcity, for instance. And then finally, solutions for these problems are oftentimes going to draw from a variety of different fields. So if you think back to the issues I put up there, um, poverty, hunger, migration, you can see that they have these things in common. Finally, though, part of the point that I want to make and part of the point that we're having this conversation now is that we're living in a time where we are facing a very wicked problem. In fact, oftentimes uh, when I introduce the, the concept of the wicked problem, people are confused and it's difficult. Now with COVID-19, everybody understands. Ever since this came out, it has been resistant to previous solutions. Ever since this has come out, we've been uncertain about how to solve it. It's like we're on a very long, very curving road and we keep hoping to arrive at a moment of clarity where we go, ah, now we understand, now we know what to do. I will point out as well that COVID-19 finally, to the extent that we are going to be able to solve it, it is going to be an interdisciplinary solution. It draws from the sciences, obviously, but politics very much comes into play. Um, sociology and human interaction very much comes into play. Cultures are coming into play. Um, language and the arts and how we communicate the message will definitely come into play. So part of the point I want to make is that this is a particular moment with COVID, and I'll address this more at the end of my talk, but we have a moment where this, we have clarity about the complexity of the world and the way that the world operates. The point I finally want to make is that we live in a complex world. We live in a wicked world where more than often than not, the problems we face are going to be of the wicked persuasion. Um, 
Oftentimes, this is because of the nature of the problems themselves. Oftentimes, it's because our students may study one thing and then face something else. Or even if they study something and they learn it very well and then they go into the workplace, the workplace is constantly changing. It's constantly evolving as well. There's new technologies, there's new clientele, there's new communication methods, and there's new communities that we're building and interactions that we're having with different people from different areas. So we live in a complex world. We live in a wicked world. And of course, as Edmund Coe, the engineering professor would say to me, if my wicked engineering students are going to face wicked problems, they better have wicked competencies. My response to that is if all of our students are going to face wicked problems, they all better have wicked competencies. So what do we mean by that? Well, finally, we need to graduate from our university students who are open to new challenges, who when they face a new problem, know how to stay calm, know how to think about it carefully, and don't freak out necessarily. They don't panic when they see this problem. They understand that new problems are how life works that when they approach a problem, they're deliberate and thoughtful. We have lots of people who can respond, but simply responding without thinking is not going to be helpful. Um, there needs to be a combination of courage. You're seeing something you haven't seen before and you're, you have to move forward with humility, recognizing that you don't understand everything and that you need to think and you might need to do some exploration. You might need to reach out to other communities and other resources in order to solve these problems. Again, people, uh, our graduates will need to be able to draw from multiple areas. They need to be able to draw ideas from one area and adopt it to another area. They need to not be afraid to fail because when we face something we haven't seen before and that we hadn't anticipated and we're going to try to solve it because we must try to solve it, it's not going to work every time. In fact, I would make the argument that more times than not, it's going to fail. I have a dear colleague in chemistry who says of everything else he wants the students to know, he wants them to know that 95% of the time he gets it wrong. And that every time he gets it wrong, it takes him a step closer to getting it right. So that failure is part of moving forward. And then of course, the ability to try again when they do fail. The problem, and this is why education was included in my initial list, is that oftentimes education itself is not wicked, rather it's tame, which is again an engineering term. They talk about the wicked problems and then they talk about the tame problems or the static problems. So too often when we are providing education to our students, the parameters of the challenges we put in front of them or the problems we give to them or the literary texts that we provide them or whatever content we give them, oftentimes the parameters are static. The situation is not fluid, it's fixed. Oftentimes we are waiting for one definitive answer in our head. We have a sense of a right answer. Even when we don't have that sense of the right answer, sometimes our students assume that that we believe in a single answer and that their job is to find that single definitive answer rather than recognizing that there might be multiple ways of approaching this and that it's valuable for them to explore those multiple ways. And then oftentimes memorization of a static answer is enough for a student to move on and perform really well. I'll talk later on about Hong Kong. One of the reasons that Hong Kong shifted its entire university system is because they were producing students who were very, very, very good at taking tests and performing very well on those tests. And the minute they faced a problem they hadn't seen before, they were at a loss. I'm obsessed with this world of wicked problems, so much so that I've, I've, I've written books about it, I write articles about it. Every time I think I'm done, something else comes up. And so what I wanna do now for the next 15 minutes or so is simply explore how wicked problems might play out in the university setting. And I want to approach it on a variety of different levels. I want to begin with the, the level of the projects and the assignments and the assessments, even the exams that we give students. And oftentimes when we think about the, the um, assignments we give students, we make assumptions about who they should write to. We make assumptions about how they should approach it and what answer would be a good answer and what answer would be a bad answer. And I wanna bring into play a dynamic where we also make assumptions about who has expertise. We assume that we're always the one that know and they assume that they're the ones who do not know. So I wanna mix that up a little bit and show some assignments that have 
that place students in the position of wicked participants, that force them to take some responsibility and play with fluid dynamics. So here's an example from biology. Now, several things make this wicked. This is, by the way, the prompt to the students. This is what the students are being asked to do. They will be choosing which region. So there is not a particular area that we necessarily have expertise. They could pick a part of Central America. They could pick a part of the Western United States. They could pick a part of Eastern Africa. They could pick a part of um, the, um, the Russian Far East. Um, that's fluid. So they have to gain expertise in an area that we might not know anything about. In addition, though, they have to not think about a simple answer based upon one set of criteria, but upon conflicting multiple areas that come together, economics, um, societal customs, cultural factors, environmental factors, all of these don't work together. They conflict each other. So they have to find a path that is complicated. Here's another example. Here again, the students are studying art. They oftentimes think about art as me expressing my ideas. But here they come in contact, contact with a more complicated environment, a more complicated context. They have to think about the community needs. They have to think about how art can interact with the community needs. They need to think about what it is they're trying to um, do within the community. They need to think about how to get ideas from the community. They need to think about the mathematics and the budget and the economics of it. What I love about this assignment, when I encountered it, it occurred in a first year of university study. So students didn't go into the field of art thinking that art was simply about emotional representation. They recognized that it had all these fluid components coming together. Some of them worked well together and some of them did not. An example from the field of literature, my own field. Three poems to help a grieving family. Here's what makes it tricky. These poems cannot be about death or grief. This is important because it shows that when I talk about oftentimes wicked problems require us to take ideas from one field into, an, into another field, that means we have to think about not just the content, the surface level meaning of the material, but how it operates operates on a conceptual level. So by saying you can't hand them a poem about grief, you have to think about how literature and art operates not just superficially, but conceptually, theoretically. It pushes them beyond the surface level meaning. And that ability to go beyond the surface level meaning allows students to move from one area to another and take ideas and methodologies from one area to another. That said, I think this is very important um, this also asks them to still analyze the poetry. So they're still doing the normal work of a scholar in the field of literature. The same with all of the examples I'm giving. They're still doing the work of a biologist. They're still doing the work of an artist. Um, they're simply doing it for a different audience. This feature of audience is also very important. If students are writing to us or performing for us all the time, there's a dynamic where they're here and we're here, which means that they, they know they can defer to our authority, to our knowledge, to our skills. What we want to do is create a dynamic where they're here and the audience to whom they're working with or with whom they're working is here, which means that they have to assume the authority. They have to become the expert. They can't defer. That assuming responsibility is really part of part being an um, effective citizen in a complex, wicked world. We have to assume responsibility. We can't simply defer to other people's authority all the time. Sometimes we do. An example from evolutionary psychology. This is an important example because there isn't a right answer. We don't know how the brain is going to change cognitively or neurologically. The point is not student, memorize the answer and hand it to me. The point is, here's a problem you haven't seen before. I wanna see how carefully you can think about it. 
I want to see how carefully you can apply the methodologies of our field and try to respond to this problem. I'm looking at your process as much as I'm looking at your answer. We could have students have five different answers, just as, frankly, with literature, students can arrive at five different conclusions, or with statistics, students can arrive at five different conclusions, or with physics, students can arrive at five different conclusions. What matters is how carefully are you approaching this? There are going to be some answers that are better than others, but we wanna see how carefully you can apply methodology and thoughtfulness as you're approaching an answer that hasn't been defined yet. Now, of course, if we're going to provide students with wicked exam questions and wicked projects, um, we're changing the rules of education on them. Oftentimes they get into university because they become very good at, at memorizing answers, at learning how to play by traditional rules. So if we're going to change the rules, we need to give them opportunities to practice in this new way, to think in this new way. Um, students are going to need to be able to practice wicked problems in ways where they can do it repeatedly, in ways where they have increasing independence, where we help them a lot at first and later on they have to do it very much on their own. They're also going to need to do it in situations where they can fail. Remember that last idea? Failure uh, leads to greater knowledge, greater skill, um, the ability to get back up and try again. I like to, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can create spaces in the classroom for failure. I was at an institution about five, eight years ago where um, what you would find is a, um, almost in every class, in every field, they would require a 3,000 word paper for the final project in the course. And almost every time those final papers were worth 70% of the final grade for the course. There is no room for failure there. When the risk is that high, when the consequences are that high, students are going to play it safe. We need to create situations where students can experiment, try new things, get it not quite right, rethink, reconsider, try again. I think to think about situations that are ungraded where there is no grade, that are minimally graded where there is a grade but it's very small, or that are proportionally graded, which is to say that early on the grade doesn't count for a lot. Later on, I'm assuming you're accepting more responsibility and you're becoming smarter and you've had a chance to practice, so it will count for more. A couple examples, and I won't spend too much time on these. In geoscience, we give them a rock sample early on. They've got to draw a relatively clear conclusion, and that's worth only 5%, so it's proportionally graded. Later, there's more complex data sets, and the work is a little harder for them to figure out. Those are worth 10%. And then later in the course, multiple conclusions. It's a complex data set, and it's worth a greater percentage. Okay, very simple idea. Early on, they can risk, they can fail, it won't destroy their grade. Later on, they're learning more, they have to apply the skills in more complicated situations, and the grade counts for more. Um, a very simple thing that you can do in almost any field, something called a Monday morning problem or a Wednesday afternoon problem or however you wanna do it. But once a week, we come into class and we present them a complex, messy problem. Students work in groups. We don't ask them to come up with a single solution to this problem. We ask them to come up with three different solutions, three different ways that you might approach this problem. This is really important because if, if students are going to try and not succeed, they need to be able to have backup plans, backup approaches. So we're getting to think in multiple ways rather than a single simple way. Um, then we list all of the solutions up on the board and then we discuss as a class which one is best. Okay, so again, there's that emphasis on process rather than a single definitive answer. This is ungraded because it happens in the class in real time. And you can do this in any field. You could do it in literature, you could do it in mathematics, you could do it in political science even. Um, in a literature classroom, um, oftentimes students have to write papers and it's really complicated, particularly since every professor is looking for something different. So here's a technique we could use in the literature classroom where students work in groups and they do short essays. Um, and of course, collaboration, working with other people is also a complex, wicked skill. And then later on, they do a final essay that's individual, but they get multiple attempts to practice writing essays for this particular professor. And this again could occur in any classroom without a lot of consequences for them. 
Further, if we're going to do this, we have to have students have a clear understanding of why we're having them engage wicked problems. Now, there are two ways to approach this. One is to simply tell them. And there is increasing amounts of data. And I, I like that part of the, the goal of this process is to find ways to collect meaningful data. In the United States, we have a, an organization called the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Every three years, they survey employers asking them what they're looking for. And we come up with lists like this, which say, to, um, what are the main skills? And you'll see, if you look down the left-hand side of the screen, that a lot of these competencies are going to be wicked competencies, working collaboratively with a team, critical thinking, um, application in real world settings, um, ability to demonstrate complex problem solving, ethical judgments. It's easy to solve a problem if you don't worry about ethics but we must, <laughs> we live in a world where ethics really matter, creative thinking. So sharing this data with students is going to move them out of a simplistic understanding of what the world is going to require and what therefore education re would require. The point I like to make though is telling students is effective but not nearly as effective as having them live the experience, finding some way to have them occupy uh, a wicked problem early on to see what it's like to be in that problem and to see how it, these problems occur in the world. So there's some very obvious ideas that we oftentimes do already, internships or placements where they leave the university and go into the workplace. And what they'll find is that you can't think about things in a simplistic way. Undergraduate research where students, even when they're undergraduates, are working in the lab with chemists, are working in um, digital research with humanists, are perhaps gathering and looking at statistical data with um, professors in political science or psychology. Um, there again, what they see is that the cleanness oftentimes that we encounter in a textbook or the simplicity that oftentimes they perceive in a lecture it's more complicated than that. It's messier than that. And that messiness is actually normal. Simply bringing graduates back to campus and saying, talk about what your experience has been like. Talk about how the field works in the real world as opposed to how it might have worked here. But how else can we blur the lines between a static university? And I think it's worth noting a lot of the tame methodologies we engage, we do them out of necessity, right? We're working with large classes. I have to give a grade I, that requires me to simplify. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's a good structure. So how else can we do this? Well, on a curricular level, I'll give you the example of Worcester Polytechnic in Worcester, Massachusetts here in the United States. Sophomore year, students are asked to work in a small group with a professor and take on a real world problem that comes from a sponsor in the real world. They spend all semester only on that problem. No other classes. It counts for three or four classes, but it's all that they do. And then they do something very similar their senior year. So they're, you're taking the complexity of the world rather than dividing the, um, a course schedule for a particular semester into three or four different classes, you're saying, here's how it all blends together. Here's how it all blurs. Groningen University in, um, in fact, all of the Dutch universities in the Netherlands um, also uh, employ wicked problems very regularly in their curriculum. In fact, uh, Groningen uses project-based learning. Students work collaboratively. They do this all three years. Every year of their university education, they encounter a wicked problem and they work on it in the and the problems are fascinating, dealing with refugees, for instance, um, neighborhood sustainability, um, designer human beings thinking about um, how we might alter DNA while children are still in the womb in order to avoid particular problems or enhance particular skills. Um, I like the, the very last one, sustainability and civil society on Mars. That's a perfect example of a wicked problem, right? There isn't a perfect answer. We don't necessarily know the answer. And it's not just about science, it's also about ethics, it's about politics, it's about sociology, how the world works together. It's also about psychology. So, sorry. And of course, all of this raises questions have to actually dramatically revive the entire university 
um, in order to respond to a wicked world. And there's a part of me that says perhaps we do. And again, I will refer to the example of Hong Kong. In 2000, Hong Kong did a survey of the employers in the region. And keep in mind that in Hong Kong, there is no agriculture, there is no industry. It is a 100% service culture. What is that the employers were not satisfied with the Hong Kong University students who, as I mentioned earlier, were very good at responding to tests, but not good at facing problems that they hadn't seen before. So what they did is they shifted the entire university system for 7 million people, eight different universities from a three-year system to a four-year system that included this concept of general education, which implies that students not only study one area, they also uh, have comprehensive breadth. So I may study literature, but I'm going to know some things about science and I'm going to know some things about mathematics. And finally, they required that this be woven into the fabric of the four years, not just here are some foundational skills, get them out of the way and then do the really important thing that is your major. No, you do general education and your major all along. They are of equal importance. It really was a rethinking of how education worked in Hong Kong. Now, I will point this out that in the United States, the term that we use for general education is the liberal arts. It derives from the Latin artis liberalis, which means the arts by which a person is free. And the concept is that a person not only can think and they know, but they can think and respond to situations they haven't seen before. And only then are you truly free, when you can think outside of the finite context. I will point out that as China has moved into, mainland China has moved into Hong Kong politics, that there are some questions about how they're responding to the liberal arts in Hong Kong. There is a recognition that when we're providing people with an education that not only gives them skills, but allows them to think and engage the world in meaningful ways, and to not just respond to the world, but to author and create new ways of thinking about that world. It is a challenge to some of the things that an authoritarian government might be looking for. And of course, the question is, how does this change our roles? One question is, how does this change our roles as professors? I've been in the classroom for three decades now. Will it require us to do less lecturing and sort of more guiding, less judging, as in my job here is to give you a grade, and more of my job here is to help you move from point A to point H, perhaps less grading, more feedback. Are there ways to create student agency through partnerships? It's not just about me determining what we're going to do as a class, but how can we work together to determine that? And further questions about the university more broadly. What about the departmental structure? What about the graduation requirements? Is a single field enough or is more needed? Um, what about faculty agency? Where do faculty have a voice in this? If we're going to have students who have agency and can, can engage a complex world, can we do that if faculty have no or very minimal agency? Where do we create opportunities for faculty or administration or staff to fail and experiment? What role do teaching evaluations play? What role should they play? Um, if we're asking faculty to change how the classroom operates with students, um, that means messing or playing around with student expectations. Students may not respond to that particularly well because the rules are changing and that can feel threatening. If that's the case, what happens when we're using a simplistic evaluation form of teaching? That said, I've worked with enough universities to know that if I end with these questions, something gets lost. So I want to return the focus to where it needs to be. Finally, yes, we've got university politics that are complicated and that we know we need to address. We've got colleagues that we know we are asking to think and rethink about who they are in relationship to teaching and their students and the university. Finally, though, this is about the students. So here are some other questions that I think need to be asked. Are there places where our students can be part of the conversation about designing their education, perhaps for the entire institution? perhaps just within a department, 
perhaps just for a particular course, perhaps just for them. How else might we shift agency to students? Where can we ask students not just to receive information, but to create something in whatever field we're working in, any field? How can we ask students to connect ideas and make something, not just separate pieces of information, but a whole symphony of ideas that has meaning and impact? In a world where information can be gathered very quickly, some of it true, some of it not, how do we make me learning, being in the classroom, reading a book, engaging in discussion, hearing a lecture, how do we make that not just information being passed from one person to another, but meaningful? And finally, how do we ensure that this happens for all students, not just the high performing ones? It's very easy to design a curriculum that works for our great students. But I want to make sure we the curriculum that works for our, our B students and our C students as well. So finally, our graduates are going to enter, enter a messy, complicated world. They need to be able to engage in thoughtful, deliberate change. They need to recognize that they can't just accept the world as it is, that we have an obligation to move the world forward. A lot of our educational structures are tame. They're fixed. They're static. They don't match this complexity of the world, which shapes the students' expectations as they go into the world. We can change how we operate as, a, as an academy. We have to change. And here's the final point. COVID has given us a rare moment to do this. We've been forced to change how we deliver education. We've been forced to reconsider our students' needs at a particular moment, not just in terms of the information they're getting, but in terms of their wellness, in terms of their technological needs, all of these are in play. We've been forced to really rethink our content. I can't deliver as much virtually in 16 weeks as I can in person. So what information really matters? How am I going to assess what they've done and how effective that is? All of these have been called into question. When we think about the brain and we think about neuroscience, we're thinking about the malleability of the brain. We know that when we're younger, our brains are very malleable. They shift very quickly. Well, that's true of us as a profession as well. When the field, when the profession was being formed, how we thought about learning and how learning worked could shift very quickly. Now we've oftentimes fallen into traditions. We've lost that malleability. Sometimes they're good traditions. Sometimes they're good habits. Sometimes they're out of necessity, but sometimes they're not. This is a moment where we can question why we do things, how we do things, and where we might go in order to do it better. I am so grateful that you have allowed me to be part of this conversation. Um, I, and thank you for your patience. My apologies for the length of my talk. I will turn it over um, to Professor Villette and we can have some conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. That was very insightful and very thought provoking. Thank you so much um, for that uh, presentation. I think um, if there are anyone who has a comment, we can spend maybe the next five to 10 minutes on uh, any comments that you may have. You can raise your hand um, under the button that shows the reactions at the bottom of your screen, if you have any, um, then please do that. And I will um, recognize you. Uh, If not, I don't see any um, hands raised. Oh, I see there's one. Okay, two, um, two hands raised. Uh, can we hear from Paul? Are you on? I hope I'm saying that correctly. Paul, please um, unmute yourself. Paul, are you on? Unmute one, please um, unmute yourself and go ahead with your question. Oh, the Zoom meeting. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Please go okay. ahead. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you very much. 
Um, uh, that was a very um, interesting uh, presentation. And um, I'm, I keep thinking about all the discussions, um, agendas, and the curricula that uh, we operate in Africa uh, on the continent as a whole at the tertiary level. And um, it is our initiatives we tend to forget a significant proportion of students with disabilities who are on campuses throughout Africa. And yet, um, in our policy discourses and uh, agendas and curricula, we, um, we do not factor the learning of these students into our curricula. Our university administrators often uh, marginalize students with disabilities and faculty with disabilities. And we've been doing this forever. And I'm beginning to wonder, even before COVID, and now that COVID is ending, um, we will never catch up with, with meeting the learning needs of these growing numbers of students with disabilities on our campuses. And I'm beginning to wonder, when is the AAU and other continental bodies going to begin to think um, serious thinking of how we have marginalized 20% of students with disabilities who are on campuses throughout um, higher institutions in Africa. So that's my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, so I, I don't know if Paul will be able to answer that, but we, we will put that on the, uh, um, we will uh, take note of that. Robert Awula, Awua, please, Robert, uh, can yeah, you please keep is... it um, short and um, to the point, please? Uh, sure, please go sure. Um, Paul, this is just a quick question for Paul. Uh, with your, uh, uh, I can see your background now. In terms of ability to perform uh, as a student who graduated from any university here in the U.S., any part of the world, and also in Africa, what do you see uh, to be the most significant difference uh, for, in terms of the ability to go out there and do really function? Repeat the last question. The most significant difference between an African graduate and the last bit? Let's say a student from the U.S. Let's say two students, one from the all in engineering, African graduate, uh, U.S. graduate universities. What do you see to be the most significant? And I'm talking of the wiki professor concept that you presented. Mm -hmm. What are we doing wrong in Africa and that is making our students so bad in terms of their ability to function? I, uh, uh, Paul, I, before you answer, maybe you can just note that and then I, I've got two more hands and then maybe we can then just take all of those together. Um, okay. There's Louis Adekola. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Louis Adekola, actually, and I just wanted to say that was a really, really brilliant um, presentation, um, Prof. Thank you for sharing. Um, I personally feel very uh, concerned because, um, I, I, of course, I've done my first degree and I did a master's in Nigeria before I went to the UK for another master's in education. And I, I feel that the problems that we have in the AI education system in Africa is very complex. But if we keep thinking that these problems are consistently complex and we don't start doing taking action towards them, it will stay that way. And I'm just trying to say that with all this presentation that we've heard today, it's really indeed a call to action for everyone. And it's really important that professors begin to see themselves less as oppressors, less as um, superpowers or superheroes in the higher education system in our country. And I'm glad that a lot of lecturers are here present. So 
from the students the, to the professors, to the university, we just need to start finding a way to solve in these problems, no matter how little they are. We can't just keep piling these potential solutions together and assuming that in the future it will work out. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say that that was a great presentation and I hope we can take it and run with it. All right. Thank you, Louis. And then finally, we will have Olivia. Olivia, please, can you pose your question? Uh, thank, thank you very much. It's Olivia from uh, the Council on Higher Education, South Africa. Uh, Paul, thank you very much for an insightful and thought-provoking uh, presentation. My, my question is, I'm actually just wondering, universities are complex um, organizations um, and very, very, in most cases, very conservative. What you mm -hmm. are, are proposing is a shift in thinking. Actually, it's about teaching the students how to think. Um, irrespective of the content or the subject matter, how do we get the institutions to make the shift? It will be a lot easier for other for one disciplines, but others it will be a lot more complex. How, how do you get the, the universities or the higher education institutions to make the shift? Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivia. I'm going to allow just one more person, Andrew, and then I'm going to ask the rest of the people, please do um, put your uh, questions or your comments in the chat, and Hello? Then, um, then Paul will uh, address them. Hello, uh, my hand was up. <laughs> um, my hand was up. Yeah, so. I know there's, there's a lot of people with hands up, um, and we're just trying to manage the time. Okay, Momo, if you, if you can keep it just really very short, Andrew, very short, and Dr. Bridget, very short, so that okay. Paul can just respond very quickly to all of us. Okay. And that's going to be it, then we move into this, the breakout sessions. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Paul, thank you very much. My name is Momo Yakubu. I'm at uh, uh, Texas Southern University in Houston. I've been uh, uh, an alumni of uh, Carnegie Fellowship for three times. And uh, all the points you highlighted are well taken. And I try a lot to be able to help in curriculum development that focuses on students and to, to follow the dynamic of the changing world, like you call it, which is a wicked world. But if we have a wicked world and we're not preparing our students to be wicked in tackling the, the, the problem, then we'll continue to be in the same situation we found ourselves right now. But unfortunately, is that the structure that we have in the African universities and by African government make it a lot difficult for us to give our students the best. One of them is the perennial strike, especially like for example in Nigeria. The, the faculty are strike forever. The, the, the government is not ready to do anything. And then at some point, the faculty are not even ready to accept any arrangement to be able to help the student. And which make curriculum that targets and focus on student meeting the outside world to solve African problem is very, very, is one of the challenging, most challenging that is out there. So how are we going to be able to come up with a, a plan to be able to help this student to, to do and get hands on, our students are very smart, but they are yeah. not exposed to uh, the wicked solution that we need for our problem. Very, very, very smart. Yeah. You know, thank so. You, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Momo. Andrew and then Dr. Bridget and then Paul will give you a couple of minutes to um, respond. Andrew? Okay, yeah. Thank you for the nice presentation. But I have just one a short question. How do we develop curriculum as teachers uh, to cater to students with variable learning capabilities? There are students who are sharp. There are those who are kind of slow. What do, we, what do we do to come up with curriculum that we can uh, cater to this wide variety of learning capabilities? All right, mm -hmm. thank you, Andrew. And then Dr. Bridget is the final person, okay. Can you please unmute, Doctor, your, your mic is mute. All right, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Um, I'm Dr. Thibault Bridget from the University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth, USA. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation. My question has to do with what um, 
Olivia had mentioned in terms of the university being very conservative um, and, and, and that the need for a paradigm shift to get students to think is something that we need to focus on. Uh, the question that I have is how do we create that kind of environment and space that gives students more voice and more resources? Because I think the universities, especially in Africa and also here in the US inherited a colonial system that is so strict and regimented and that students quite often are not given uh, the proper resources and attention that they need. And so how can we give voice to students? How can we get more students to think for themselves and not regurgitate what we've been teaching them? And also, how do we make sure that we revamp the curriculum to, um, especially in Africa, the curriculum that will meet African development needs? Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, Paul, it's over to you. Okay, how long do you want to give me? Um, you have five minutes, but you can address okay. some of these issues again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> to no, no, no. I'll, I'll, given that, I'll try to do sort of short answers, and then we people will be able to work in groups, and maybe we can come back for some and some some longer discussion. Um, Robert's question, difference between African students and American st or uh, US students. I would say, frankly, you and we've got colleagues from uh, two American universities here, it sounds like as well. Um, American universities are struggling with these same problems. We are struggling with um, students who um, uh, come in thinking that education is all about memorization of answers and that there's a right answer and a wrong answer all the time. Sometimes there is. Um, American um, uh, universities have uh, sometimes very top-down administrations who are making decisions without uh, paying attention to um, uh, the voices of the faculty and the voices of the students. Um, American universities oftentimes have political um, bodies that are interfering with, you know, in an attempt to help or sometimes in an attempt to direct and control um, what's happening at university. So I don't know that there is a difference. I will though um, approach it as well by thinking about Andrew's question. Um, how do we deal with differential levels? Um, a lot of the work that I'm doing on wicked problems derives from George Kuh, K-U-H's, K-U-H, his work on high impact practices. Um, these are things like internships, undergraduate research, first year seminars, e-portfolios, that we know that the more students encounter them, the better they are at critical thinking and problem solving when they leave the university. What it shows us, his research in that area shows us, it helps all students improve. It helps less traditionally high performing students improve even more. So by bringing the wicked problems of the world and the complexity of the world into play, oftentimes it helps students engage education in ways that are more meaningful, rather than it being a game of, I will take the information you give me and hand it back to you, which seems useless. It has, feels like a real world application, which makes greater sense. So this can actually help lower performing students even more. Um, Olivia and um, MoMA's questions. Um, what I'm going to say is in terms of how do we, how do we turn the, the ocean liner of higher education, um, it's difficult and it's going to require work at all levels. And one level, go out, survey employers, find out what it is they really need from the students that they're hiring from African universities. Because when you have that data, you can then pivot to the politicians and say, you're asking us to do this, but here's what the employers want. And here's what the employers need. Here's what the world we live in demands right now. So that's part of it. But I don't want to make education only about employment because it's not. I study literature. I study poetry. It's also about the development of the students. So in terms of engaging um, 
I think I think what we need to work on within the university is creating pockets of change. Faculty who think about things similarly, who are engaged with these wicked problems, for whom these wicked problems make sense, and who want to change their classrooms. Can we find ways for those faculty on a campus to collaborate together, to share ideas, to voice and share with what they're doing with colleagues from other departments and simply grow change that way? We know from general data, at least within the American context, that usually you're going to have 20% who will adopt any change, 20% who will resist any change, and 60% in between who are waiting. So find the 20% who are going to adopt the change and help them adopt it, and then help them communicate how they adopted it and the impact of it to the 60%. The other 20% love them dearly, they are our colleagues, but they will do what they're going to do and we're not gonna worry about them. Um, Bridget's question about student voices is, is really important. Um, and, I, and it's more, I don't know that I have a, a simple answer that I can give in one minute other than to say student voices are, are incredibly valuable. Faculty oftentimes don't hear student voices enough. Administration oftentimes don't hear student voices enough. I would really encourage bringing alumni back again, back to the university to share what life is like after university and to share what things really worked and what things really mattered versus the things that they thought mattered at the time, but turn out that they didn't matter so much. I mean, I have a, a colleague, a good friend who's, who uh, works in HR in engineering and she's learned not to hire straight A students in engineering anymore. Mm. Because they think that only taking the test matters. When they get into the real world, they learn that risk matters. So bring those voices back, make sure that the students are hearing those voices, and then make sure that the students have opportunities to share their ideas as well. Uh, five imperfect answers, I apologize for, to everybody, but I know we want to move the conversation along. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Great response. Thank you. I think we're going to be breaking into our um, breakout sessions now. You will... Okay. Um, thank you. Are we all back? Yes. Okay. So group one is back. Uh, group two is back. Uh, group four, I just heard Cynthia. Group four is back. Group three and two, are you back? We are back. Group two yeah, is back. Yeah, but we started oh, okay. late, so... We didn't, okay. yeah, we didn't do sorry. much. Okay. Um, can I just also uh, remind people that the chat is there. You can also put your, um, your comments in the chat. I noticed that we have gone from uh, 100 to 73. So I think people would like to um, uh, get uh, this, uh, this webinar um, over and uh, so that they can move on. I know it's kind of late. So I'm going to ask the uh, facilitators to please just two minutes each, just give us the key issues that um, you think we need to consider uh, for future, uh, particularly as it pertains to where are the good things happening? Um, what kind of data do we need to collect in order to make sure that we uh, uh, can devise policies around these issues that are evidence-based, and then, of course, um, uh, what kind of uh, evidence is already available. If you could just briefly uh, treat your, your feedback in, in that way, if it's possible. Thank you. So let me go to group one first, Pamela. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. So just, just. Uh, um, so let me just do that quickly. So just quickly. Uh, um, where did I go? Okay. So uh, we're just looking at what did what issues did we agree upon? So it, definitely time to shift. Everybody's on board with this. This is this is a, a good way to go. Paul, we were really inspired by your by your presentation. And so um, uh, uh, there, 
people have also found that the, already there is collaboration with other universities that is taking place. So universities that have already had a chance to, to test, and I'm just putting it in brackets, wicket, uh, uh, those partnerships can be a jump, uh, can be a springboard to, to start off with. Also, um, so, uh, someone mentioned the fact that we, most universities have a community, a community engagement uh, uh, factor that staff are, so it's not, too far a stretch to say so how can we really do this and accelerate this to 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 include the concept of of wicked and then of course we uh, nothing happens without policies uh, uh, in place so there has to be policies and even if there are people are resistant the, the 2020 20, uh, percent people are resistant and people are still waiting at least the policy supports those who are willing to 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 put the the ball uh, into in, into role and then um of course the stakeholders of are important for collaboration and partnerships you know if we're going to create a wicked problem then we have to say who, who are we working with what who are the outside people outside of our university who's going to who are the ministries who are the uh, uh, who, are, who are the community people that we're going to work with and so the collaboration is important and they they must be brought into the policy uh, 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 framework from the start then uh, not that it was controversial, but someone mentioned that the term wicked might be a problem for some of us Africans. Okay, and then mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, what can, what uh, uh, cases that were shared, we have a, a you and, the, and, 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 and people were saying that it works better if it comes from, instead of people from this platform going to the university and say, oh, we have this brilliant idea, AAU, as, as they are, are, are part of this forum, uh, should be pushing for the implementation with the VCs in the, in the loop from the beginning. And I know that there is going to be, uh, what we are saying today is going to be part of a future uh, um, a workshop with the vice chancellors or meeting with the vice chancellors. So, uh, and then uh, there's a current collaboration with Carnegie, for example, with African countries that uh, uh, where they, is fantastic uh, um, collaboration. And these are, are where uh, 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 things are happening and the, the countries can collaborate with this from who knows and yeah, people who know and people who don't, who might not know, but that uh, uh, is already working. And so you're starting from a point of, uh, instead of having to look for people to, to, to support us. Um, and then, and, and then very importantly, as uh, uh, our last speaker said, there are great things happening in Africa already. And uh, people, we just need to highlight these things that are happening, these brilliant things that are happening and use those as best case scenarios, best examples, so that it is not just something that is coming from outside, but that things are already happening here yeah, and we need to share these, these ideas. That's what we had to say, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, uh, Pamela from Group One, great ideas. I think there was something that I really liked also in Group One was the, uh, uh, the lady who spoke from South Africa, with, I think it's Olivia, who talked about quality assurance um, uh, um, in her country, but I think maybe we could consider maybe across the continent, um, the rigidity of how people have to submit their programs, and the way that it's packaged may also be contributing to the rigidity that we see happening in university teaching and learning and curricula. So I think that's also a very important issue that, uh, that she brought up. So um, I just wanted to add that. Can we go to group two? Two minutes, yep. please. Thank you. Um, well, Pamela, you set the bar high by having a nice um, PowerPoint, um, but if you stop square. I just need to take it out. Uh, yes. That will distract the group. Um, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. That's okay. I just uh, was writing notes. Um, so um, thank you for that um, comment. And it builds on what we were talking about in our group when we were talking about curriculum, uh, that there are already some really good things that are happening across the continent. Um, and I wanna summarize what the important things are when we think about curriculum, 
highlight where it's happening and then some challenges we discussed. So the idea, <clears throat> there is an importance of redesigning curriculum, um, really working at the department and faculty level and with stakeholders in, in that part, um, talking about a competency-based rather than just content, um, having a very clear mission so that um, it's clear to accreditation, which was seen as a barrier, um, that that's of what is happening. Um, the talk about moving forward from what we learned in the pandemic, of uh, providing practical experiences for our students, not just online content delivery, um, and a hands-on focus to what's going on. And one of the things we learned is that in Kenya, there are things already happening. Judith shared the idea of re uh, changing um, what they're doing, making it competency-based with very clear outcomes. So it really is creating opportunities for students to become thinkers and problem solvers. And the idea of wicked students that Paul described. In Ghana, they're working, um, I believe it is with the Carnegie Foundation, but with professors and working to train professors to be impactful in their teaching because they probably went through a much more colonial based system. So the idea of these new PhD candidates that are going through the university, really working with them to provide impactful instruction. Um, in Namibia, um, they talked, Helena talked about transformation of curriculum already. And we pushed her to talk about what does that look like and the idea of creating an internship for everybody where they get to apply what they're learning and come back and figure out um, how to make adjustments. Also problem-based um, courses. Some challenges that people talked about was just overcoming the barriers of a colonial legacy of institutions. Also talked about accreditation, which seemed to happen in um, the first group of how do you overcome some of the uh, stringent rules that might occur in accreditation and get the accrediting boards to think differently. Um, and I think that's my two minutes. And um, I think, you know, we, we definitely want to look at what's going on in Kenya, in Namibia, in Ghana, at least those are the three countries that were um, identified in our group. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, the group three. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, we, um, unfortunately we started uh, very late because we couldn't join uh, earlier our group. And I would like to um, request uh, my co-facilitator to report and um, I will be able to fill in if there's any gap. Is, was that Saki? Yes. Saki, can you come in, please? Dr. Prof. Ipingi, uh, please. Please go ahead, you are on mute. We can see you. Okay, while he's doing that, can we go to group four and then maybe you could just see what is happening with his sound. Group four, can you, um, can you do your presentation please? And then we'll go back to group three. Yes, uh, thanks Dean. Our group um, confronted the question of what we need to do differently given the presentation we had from uh, Professor Paul. And our suggestions or discussions went around the, or came to the following recommendations. Some are recommendations, some are just issues to think about. The first one was that we need to change or shift from traditional teaching and learning. And we also said that we need to consider inclusivity in terms of access, cost, and all other forms of diversity so that we can enable 
um, more or all the students to actually benefit from quality education, quality higher education. We also looked at the question of overloaded classrooms in Africa that might hamper the implementation of the new ideas uh, that we talked about in the main lecture, um, issues like project-based learning and internships and so on. Uh, people made reference to classes that are as large as 200 students and more. Then uh, the issue of blended learning um, that was uh, mostly ignited by COVID-19, that it has its benefits, but it also has um, come with exclusion of students who do not have access to uh, internet uh, devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then uh, we should put students in charge of their own learning by allowing student voices and us as a faculty taking a position of mentors uh, supporting their learning and not really be the ones that are driving the whole idea of teaching and learning. And um, we need a mindset change. Uh, faculty uh, need to change their mindset and we also need to um, ask us ask ourselves the question who decide who should decide what to be taught and actually the presenter they answered the question by saying uh, let's follow the idea that was presented about hong kong of collaboration collaboration with industry where our students are mostly employed and uh, learn from them what should be the content and context of uh, higher education. And the last uh, end of the idea of teaching from experience. Uh, we need to have uh, faculty that know what the uh, experience in the field looks like and not just have someone who comes with a PhD but they, they have never worked in the field that they're teaching uh, so that you can step a little bit away from that empirical approach. Then the last one was that uh, we need to think about teaching our in our own languages, local languages and teaching about them. So that was basically the key ideas of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hi, humble. Can we get group two, uh, sorry, group three, are you ready? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, thank you. Um, we looked at um, on the topic on, on how to prepare um, the student to better understand the, um, or to navigate in the complexity of the, of the world beyond the um, outside walls of the academy. Um, in discussing this overall question, I think, um, quite a number of points were brought up. Um, the first one was that if we want the student to fit and to understand the, um, you know, the world they are living in, um, universities or education must provide opportunities for students to see uh, a big picture. Um, there was an example of uh, courses that are being taught, but uh, students do not link them to the real life or to or they don't see the relevance of, of, of some of those courses. So students need to understand um, how to fit in the big picture. So we need to provide that opportunity. Another point that was mentioned is that university educators or lecturers have a big role to play. So we need to do things different things to do things differently not just you know, teach a curriculum. For example, um, uh, bringing professionals from the industries or from the private to come to the campus to engage the student and in that way they will uh, provide the real life experience. And um, there was an, also an, another example that was given I think in East Africa where they look or uh, teach their student through extracurricular activities. Um, in that way, the students are able to provide network 
um, engage in the seminar and discuss um, issues related to integrations and so on within the region. Um, also, another important point that was mentioned was the that students is that students must have a connection between the university. There must be there must be a connection between. Okay. Um, thank you. I think we lost uh, uh, Saki there. Um, but yes. Um, no, uh, somebody okay. muted me. I don't know who. Okay. Um, okay. Please, can we wrap up? Because the interpreters have to leave. Um, we are really okay. over time. Can we just wrap so, it up? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, oh. Um, so the, the, the point, the, another point that was mentioned is that there must be a, a connection between the, 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 the private sector and the university. So private sector must be willing to come on board, maybe fund some programs, fund uh, research, and, and uh, help the student um, to see the real um, uh, world. Another point that was mentioned was that um, academic policies in our university are more concentrating on teaching and learning and not much on, on, on community outreach. Um, and another point that was mentioned, if we want to help the student is to, to restructure our curriculum and programs. Too much content knowledge. And in most cases, um, this content knowledge is a bit not current. So we need to look at our curriculum, how we have, we structure it and so on if we want to prepare the students. So I will leave it like this. Okay. Maybe the notes will be provided later. Okay, thank you very much. I do believe that we need to wrap this up. Thank you so much, Group 3, for your contribution. Um, the uh, sessions are all recorded, so all these recordings will be um, on the website, so people will be able to access that, and there will also be a report uh, made available for uh, this whole event. Can I ask Paul to maybe take some five minutes for final um, uh, words uh, before we um, conclude? Paul, it's up, it's your floor. Sure, thank you very much. I, I don't think I'll need five minutes actually. Um, the conversation that I just heard was, um, I thought very, <laughs> very much, I mean, the, the phrase in the United States is nailed down, so hit perfectly the target about some of the ideas and some of the challenges of what needs to, to happen. Um, uh, very, very thoughtful, very inspiring, and I'm very grateful to be, um, to, to have been uh, asked to be part of this conversation. The, the only th things I would, I would sort of highlight or foreground as, as the conversation moves forward is um, one, the idea of, and I forgive me, I can't remember, multiple people said this, of, of beginning from the, the moments of strength. Where are things happening really effectively? And how can we showcase those things for our colleagues at other institutions? Um, I will and just highlight, this is, everybody knows this already, but context does matter. Different uh, institutions, different regions of different countries, different countries of the continent um, that but think of it as a, a single list of criteria of what needs to be done won't be effective. A, a box, uh, a framework um, that has space for different institutions to approach in different ways uh, will work. And then, and then the idea of ideation, of, of not thinking about a single path forward, a single idea to move forward, a single plan to move forward, but come up with multiple plans. Maybe there's one that's working with um, uh, the potential employers, one that's working with students, one that's working with faculty. And so if one plan shuts down, there are other opportunities or other paths forward. Um, that's really very important. Somebody said in the um, comments that we do need to change the way we, we teach. And I think this is really important. If we're going to ask students to engage um, in, in, in um, complex ways, um, and then we model simplistic ways ourselves, <laughs> that's not going to be particularly effective. So how can we bring complexity and that wickedness in the appropriate ways uh, to, our, to our work? 
And then avoiding simple answers and recognizing that every step forward is a step forward. And these are big problems. These are big challenges. This conversation is a big conversation. Every step forward is a step forward. So I am so grateful to have been um, invited to be part of this conversation. I have been just um, inspired by the, the dialogues I've been hearing uh, in the breakout rooms and uh, in this report back. So just thank you all so much. And please do let me know if, if I can help in any way. Thank you so much, Paul. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you for this very interesting and very thought provoking um, topic that you presented to us. And thank you everybody else for participating, um, being so active. I think we have a lot of ideas, a lot of uh, uh, suggestions on how we might be able to move forward. And I know this conversation is going to continue. Our colleagues in uh, the AU and the EU commissions, as well as the African uh, Association of Universities, uh, I know that everyone will make sure that we continue this conversation because um, as people have indicated, it is very pertinent to what it is that we are doing in higher education uh, these days. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. And have a great rest of the week. We'll see you in another space. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.